Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Kowalski, and I work in the Educational Programs Department at NORD, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's webinar, Life After Gene Therapy. Today you'll have the opportunity to hear from people who have firsthand experience with gene therapy. They've generously agreed to share their personal journeys and to tell you about their experiences leading up to, during, and after gene therapy. Today's event is part of NORD's cost-free series of educational webinars for patients and caregivers. This is the final webinar in a five-part series on gene therapy. I've thoroughly enjoyed this series, and in particular, NORD has enjoyed collaborating with the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy to provide the series. ASGCT's mission is to advance knowledge, awareness, and education leading to the discovery and application of gene and cell therapies to alleviate human disease. We would also like to say a special thanks to the webinar sponsors at Bluebird Bio, Avaro Bio, Sarepta Therapeutics, and Amicus Therapeutics. For any of you who are not familiar with NORD, we're an independent organization dedicated to improving the lives of people with rare diseases. We do this through education, research, advocacy, and patient services. To learn more about NORD's programs, services, and resources, visit our website at rarediseases.org. You can also follow NORD on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And now I would like to introduce our speakers. Nicole Almeida is the proud mother of Matea Diego, who was diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy type 1 when she was five months pregnant. She arranged for Mateo to be accepted into a phase one clinical trial at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. When Mateo was just 27 days old, he became the youngest child at that time to receive gene therapy for SMA. Mateo is now a normal, active four-year-old. He just started preschool and he's able to run through the halls of his school because of gene therapy. Charles Huff was diagnosed with sickle cell disease at the age of two. He suffered many years with pain crises and debilitating symptoms. In 2017, he received gene therapy through a clinical trial at NIH. Since that time, he's not experienced any pain crises and the quality of his life has improved dramatically. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Charles Huff. Hi, everyone, everybody. Uh, my name is Charles Huff. And at the age of two, I was diagnosed with an hereditary blood condition called sickle cell anemia, uh, type SS. I inherited two S genes, one from each parent. Sickle cell anemia is a group of, classified as a group of red blood cells that have abnormal protein. People with sickle cell have defective hemoglobin, which is the oxygen-carrying component that carries oxygen throughout the blood. The impaired hemoglobin causes red blood cells to become crescent-shaped, inflexible, and sticky, blocking blood flow throughout the body. Um, complications from sickle cell can be fatal. Uh, my symptoms. Um, extreme pain, that is worse. During a sickle cell crisis, red blood cells block vessels in different areas of the body, causing extreme pain. A uh, Fatigue. Uh, my red blood cells don't carry enough oxygen in the, in, the, in the body, so at times I felt it hard to stay awake and I had to rest often. There was one time I fell into a coma, and that was, three, that was for three days. Uh, and that was two days after I was admitted into the hospital because of, a crank, because of a pain crisis. A picture that we see here is one of the worst crises that I was uh, ever admitted into the hospital for. So one day, I was standing in Walmart, and I overheard a lady speaking about her son who was enrolled in NIH's hydroxyurea protocol. Hydroxyurea is a medication that is used to reduce pain episodes and the need for blood transfusion in people with sickle cell. I overheard her say, I overheard her say that her son was doing very well, uh, so I figured I would approach her. And uh, we talked for a couple of minutes about the protocol, and then we parted ways. Soon after that, on October the 3rd, 2016, I enrolled into NIH's hydroxyurea protocol, and I did very well myself. Uh, initially, before taking place in my own gene therapy trial, 
NIH had previously asked me to enroll in the first phase. Um, I didn't know much about it, so I politely declined. Uh, one year later had passed, and I was asked to join again. I have to gain additional, gain an additional knowledge of the overall procedure and given heavy considerations to all possibilities, I decided that I would give it a shot, and that was on March of 2018. I signed consent to the trial. Um, I had lost so many friends from sickle cell. I felt like I didn't have much to lose but everything to gain. My wife, mother, and employer were all on board, so I signed on. Picture to the right shows NIH. NIH, uh, I took this picture right before I entered for my gene therapy trial. Uh, so to prepare for my trial, I went through about a year and a half's worth of blood transfusion, physical tests, and imaging scanning. Every two weeks, I was seen at NIH uh, to receive blood. And at times before my transfusion, NIH would draw blood um, before it gave me fresh, normal blood to keep my iron and ferritin levels low. Transfusions also helped to keep hemoglobin high and the sickled cell red blood cells or the sickled red blood cells low. Um, I also had four bone marrow aspirations. And let me tell you, bone marrow aspirations are not easy. Uh, so, and so... My treatment, uh, sorry about that, stem cell. My treatment wasn't easy. In my trial, I underwent two stem cell collections, which were sent off to Paris to undergo, uh, undergo a procedure where a single hemoglobin gene is packed into a lymphoviral vector. The lymphoviral vector is a harmless virus that is used to carry genes into cells. The vector is also very effective in moving gene coding, which in my case, was a normal hemoglobin gene into my cells. Uh, the picture to the right with the circle shows uh, my collected stem cells. And I have to say that uh, during my second collection, I experienced my first and only mini heart attack and a silent stroke at the same time. Um, my stem cells had, were sent off to Paris, so I believe it was about two months later. I was admitted into my room that I was reborn in. Um, the rebirth date, which was used by NIH staff, that's something that they, they told me, um, was a day that I received my modified stem cells, and that was on September 25th, 2018. So my chemotherapy came right away, um, came right away. I believe that I was admitted for about one week before I received my first out of three bags of chemotherapy called Busophon. Uh, chemo is needed to reduce the number of white blood cells so that they would not attack or fight my new stem cells that were given to me. Um, along with the chemo, I took various medications to prevent infection from forming. After I was given my last bag of chemo, that's when the experiences of the side effects like started to happen. Um, I became very neutropenic, which is very low uh, concentration, which is a very low concentration of neutrophils in the body, and my skin darkened. I lost my hair on my head. I formed rashes uh, that spread throughout the entire body, and I lost several kilograms in weight. I suffered from lesions on my tongue and down throughout my throat. At uh, one time, I coughed up a little blood, so NIH decided to give me platelets. Uh, in the picture to the far right, it shows platelets hanging in the clear bag. It's the yellow substance. Um, at this time, also, the chemo had hit me very hard, so I'm sorry I don't have many pictures of this, uh, this stage. Um, recovery. So recovery to me was the hardest part of the whole trial. Now that the chemo had done its part and I received my new stem cells, all I had to do was get better. Um, but honestly, I felt as uh, I, 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 was, I was just so tired, I slept. I would get up every once in a while to shower, maybe eat, 
but the chemo had me so weak that I didn't stay up much at all. One day, I remember breaking down because how different the entire process made me feel. I looked in the mirror, and um, I didn't notice myself because of my darkening skin and the loss of hair. And that, that hurt. Uh, I broke down pretty much uh, during that time. Uh, so I was impatient for about 27 days before I was considered non neutropenic, uh, where I could possibly fight off the slightest infection. And my levels were above 500. It was graduation day, and I was ready to leave. But I wasn't out of the woods yet. I was still under heavy restriction, and now I had to take all of my medications by mouth. For the next 30 or 40 nights, I didn't sleep well. And one afternoon, against NIH's recommendations, uh, um, I decided to eat a hearty dinner. And that stopped the flow of my entire GI system for 30 days. So not being able to pass food caused me to vomit up everything I had recently eaten. Uh, also, recovering from, uh, you know, process, or in this process here, I recovered from hyperpigmentation, and that was very hard. Um, so. Hyperpigmentation was caused from the chemo. It caused my skin to become very dry, brittle, and itch very badly. So everything I had tried to soothe or stop the itching failed. And that lasted uh, for about three and a half, four months, I would say. So five months out now from my reborn date, um, this is... <laughs> my 10-year Facebook challenge. But I can say at this point in time, my symptoms have pretty much went away, and I felt better than ever. So in June 2018, my wife and I took a trip to Panama City, Florida, and I had recently returned from a vacation in our home country, the Philippines. I spent about 15 days in the Philippines without any complications. We decided to swim in a tourist cave, a popular tourist cave, and the water there was very, very cold. I jumped straight in. I also jumped from a 25-foot high waterfall. I drove a scooter two hours straight through the scenic parts of her island without any hospitals around, and I didn't have one worry at all. That's something I would never have done if I had sickle cell. I could have never jumped straight in the cold water without needing an emergency room afterwards. I mean, that's unheard of. It's not, not, can't do it. So what I'm, I'm, I'm saying is that I truly feel grateful to have had the chance to enroll in the gene therapy trial. Um, I feel like I have a new chance at life, a chance to live a healthy, full life without any complications or suffering I went through when I suffered from complications at sickle cell, from sickle cell. Becoming sickle cell free was a dream of mine. And it was a dream that I wanted for a long time. So not only did I play a, a direct part in a therapy that could one day save thousands and millions of lives, but I was also cured myself. And if I could do it all over again considering everything I went through and everything I just said, I would. And I'm very grateful to have been given an opportunity from NIH. Um, thank you. So uh, now I would like to turn it over to Nicole Almeida. Hi. Thank you, Charles. Hi, everyone. My name's Nicole Almeida, and I'm a mother of a four-year-old, for a four-year-old Mateo Almeida. Mateo was diagnosed in utero with SMA type 1. Um, SMA is a disease that affects the motor nerve cells in the spinal cord, taking away the ability to walk, eat, or breathe. It's the number one genetic cause of death for infants. Um, our story begins with my husband, um, Derwin, and I, who were both born and raised in Miami, Florida. We went to the same middle school, same high school, um, but we never met until we ended up working together years later. 
we were married in November of 2011. Um, we traveled. We really, truly enjoyed our, ourselves and our marriage, and we weren't in any rush to have children. In 2012, Derwin's sister um, gets pregnant with her first child. Uh, her OBGYN tests her for SMA, and she ends up finding out that she's a carrier. Her doctor tells her that she should inform her siblings about the results because there was a high probability that they were also carriers, considering that SMA is a genetic disorder. Um, after three years of marriage, we finally decided it was time to expand our family. So I, w I went in for my annual routine checkup with my OBGYN. I told her we were ready for a baby and that I wanted to have the genetic testing done. I couldn't remember the exact name of the genetic condition that my sister-in-law was a carrier of, but I asked to be tested for um, just uh, any genetic conditions that affected the muscles. She informed me that our insurance would not cover the cost of the test, and it was going to be approximately $2,500. At that point, she tested, us, um, she tested me for Fragile X, Cystic Fibrosis, and SMA. Um, it's funny because that night, I actually went home that night after my appointment and I spoke to my husband because the insurance wasn't going to cover it and it was um, pretty expensive for the testing. So we figured, you know, we would get pregnant and it might take us months. It might even take us, you know, years to get pregnant. So I went home, I spoke to him about it, and we both agreed that we wanted to go um, forward with the genetic testing. I scheduled my appointment about four weeks out, and by the time um, my appointment by the time of my appointment, I was actually pregnant. Um, so they did the testing, and the results came back on December 12th, which was happens to be my husband's birthday. We, um, I found out I was a carrier. So they went ahead and they tested my husband after that, and when we found out he was a carrier, they um, referred us over to a high-risk doctor who um, had us do an amnio when I was around four months pregnant. On March 3rd, 2015, we received the call from the doctor's office. Um, they wanted us to go in. They wanted to see us in person. I knew right away it was bad. They, if it would have been good news, they would have just given it to us over the phone, but um, they wanted to see us both. Um, so my husband picked me up from work. We drove over together. The doctor confirmed um, that Mateo had zero copies of SMN1 and two copies of SMN2. She basically told us there was no cure, there was no treatment. Um, she had no information for us. She had never had a patient um, who gave birth to an SMA, to a child with SMA. And the only patients that she knew that were carriers and did test positive for a child with SMA um, terminated their pregnancy. So um, I, we left that office um, that day. We were devastated. We obviously, we didn't plan for this. Nobody plans for this. Um, but we made it home. Um, and it's crazy, but the next four months were quite a blur. I think I ended up just keeping busy, and I dug into research in order to kind of cope with my feelings. I, needed, I felt like I needed to just keep moving. Um, through my research, I found Cure SMA. They um, gave my information to several moms who had children with SMA and, that, and moms who were very active in the community. These moms immediately contacted me and gave me all the information they could. One of the moms actually gave me information about two clinical trials that were open at the time. One trial in particular caught my attention, which happened to be the gene therapy trial. It was a one-time treatment given through an IV infusion. At that time, there was no information on this trial um, so the only thing she was able to send me was the research on the animal studies. I read through all the research. I tried to understand as much as I could. We were new to this world, and I still was trying to grasp what SMA even was. Um, so I read everything, and then we, I was still unsure. We, we didn't know what we were going to do. We obviously were grateful that there was something available, but there wasn't information, and so she sends me various, um, several videos, and one of the videos that she sends me happens to be um, these pigs that were affected with SMA, and they were dragging their feet. In the follow-up video, it shows the pigs that were treated um, were now walking without any difficulty. 
that was the moment that I felt like there, there was hope. There, you know, there might not be a cure, but there was something out there that would help my son and that would give him a longer life um, span than what the doctors predicted, which was um, a year old. So I immediately contacted um, the clinical coordinator at Nationwide Children's Hospital, and they told us that Dr. Jerry Mandel would call us back. So when Dr. Mandel called us back, I tried asking um, several questions. Obviously, the most important question was, does it work? Does it work? Like, what can you tell us? How are the kids um, reacting to the treatment? But at that point, Dr. Mandel really couldn't give us much information and was very secretive. Um, he basically just told us that, you know, it looks good, <laughs> but that was it. Um, I continued to contact the clinical coordinator probably on a weekly basis. I would email her. I would call her just to kind of, you know, follow up and see if there was any more information they could give me. Um, but they basically just told me, you know, we have to wait until he's born. Um, we have to then test him again and see if, if, you know, if he would qualify. So on July 10th, two weeks before my due date, I went into labor. I called the coordinator while I was in labor and was told to call back when the baby was actually born. Um, two weeks later, we received the confirmation that Mateo did have SMA, and we were ready to travel to Columbus, uh, Ohio. We packed up our bags and filled up our SUV with everything we could possibly need um, to stay in Ohio for about a month. Um, we arrived at the Ronald McDonald House where we were at for a full month, um, and then that's we they performed several tests on Mateo, and again they had to confirm the antibodies. They had to confirm um, the diagnosis before they moved forward with anything. On August 5th, Mateo was finally admitted to the hospital, and on August 6th, he was treated with gene therapy. He was 27 days old and the youngest baby at that time. It was, um, the day of gene therapy was incredible. Um, I guess you hear gene therapy and it sounds so complicated, and it is, but just seeing the process, knowing that if the picture in the middle shows when they were actually giving him the infusion. So he, he got it on his right hand on an IV, and um, he was just laying there. It took approximately like an hour. There was several people in our room, including Dr. Mandel and Dr. Alzheide. And um, it was just, it, I, I honestly can say that it was the first time that I felt like I could breathe um, since I received the diagnosis. Um, so at that point, um, everything went smooth. They gave him the infusion. He did get a low-grade fever. He, um, he threw up that night, but then the next day he was perfectly fine. We took him back to the Ronald McDonald house, and they had weekly follow-ups with him at that point, which turned later on into monthly follow-ups. And then it went on to every three months and then yearly. Um, he's still being seen for his follow-ups. I think he will be seen until he's about 17. So here we are um, at his actual follow-ups and um, the s several tests that they do. They, when we do go for the follow-ups, now we're going once a year. Matt gets blood work done. They check his heart. Um, they check the muscle functions. And, you know, the, it, it, at this point where the actual follow-ups are fun for us and they're great because he's progressed so well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch over. So these are Mateo's doctors, Dr. Mandel and Dr. Alzheide. And obviously he was a lot smaller on the picture all the way to the right. That's our most recent picture. Um, it's incredible to see how far we've come. And I honestly don't know where we would be without these doctors. Milestones. So at first, we really didn't notice much because he was only 27 days old. So there wasn't much he could do except cry, sleep, eat. Um, as he got older, we started noticing that he started meeting all his milestones. He rolled around like a normal baby. He could sit up. 
Um, he could sit up assisted, then he could sit up unassisted. Um, he had no issues with his feeding. His lungs were strong. We didn't have to use any equipment. We never did physical therapy. He was really developing like a normal child. Um, I think the most, um, the milestone that really blew us away, and maybe I don't want to say one that we weren't expecting, but one that we didn't know if it would happen, and we were okay if it didn't, was walking. Um, we were sitting down on the couch, and he was standing in front of us holding onto the couch, and my husband and I were talking, we had the TV on, and all of a sudden he let go and he started walking. And I think we were in so much shock that we kind of just stayed quiet for, you know, a full minute, and then we just broke down and cried. Um, it was exciting. It was exciting to see that he beat the odds and that this treatment was obviously working and he was doing so well. Um, his birthdays are a big deal. As you can see, we celebrate, we go all out, we celebrate them. He picks a theme every year, and we celebrate each and every birthday. Um, they told us he would only make it to his first birthday. We've already celebrated four birthdays, and I'm already planning next year's birthday. Um, he's adventurous. He's, he loves Disney World, Disneyland. Um, we've been to several places. We've actually already even, we traveled to Europe. Um, with him, he's been on approximately 50-something flights because we had to travel so much with the trial, and he loves it. These are just pictures of our adventures. Um, and then I want to go ahead and I want to show you, um, a, a, it's a short video of one of Mateo's milestones and Mateo doing something um, that's incredible for a child with SMA. Duro, ready? There you go, good job, good job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just to see the strength that he had, that he was able to hold up, was incredible. These moments for us are still huge. Um, I, we don't take any of it for granted. And we're just, he continues to progress each and every day. We see something new every day. It truly is incredible. As far as the future, um, Mateo is now four years old going on. 13. He's very bright. He's funny. He's outgoing. He's social. He's loving, yet he's very strong-willed and he's determined. Um, he just started preschool in August, and he loves school. He loves his teachers, and he loves his classmates. What the future holds for him. Um, as parents, we just want him to be happy and to live a life with purpose. Um, he's wanted to be an astronaut since he was four years old, and I can't wait to see him fulfill his dream of sitting on the moon and, talk, and taking his parents to Mars with him. Um, we, we don't know where we'll be in the next 10 to 20 years, but I know that Mateo will be okay and that the future of SMA has never looked brighter. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you, Nicole and Charles, for those personal and really inspiring presentations. You've had extraordinary experiences not many people have a rebirth date. Um, not many people fight all the way through a pregnancy to, to get a treatment and then transport their infant across the country while jumping through all kinds of hoops in order to get that a treatment. So we appreciate you sharing all of this with our audience. So we've been collecting questions from participants during the registration and during the live webinar, and we're going to move to a Q&A session. Um, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but we may not get to all of them. If we don't get to your question, you can email us at education at rarediseases.org, and we will try to follow up with you. Um, please bear in mind that at Nord, we're not clinicians, and Charles and Nicole aren't clinicians, and so we can't really answer questions about your specific medical condition. We want to be as helpful as possible, but um, would recommend you speak with your doctor or other health professionals for those inquiries. So we've already received um, dozens of questions asking if there are gene therapies or clinical trials for specific conditions. 
So before we start, I just want to put up this slide that will show you the links that you can use to find that information. Um, you can copy this down, but as a reminder, we're going to be sending the slides out to everyone who registered for this webinar. So with that, we can move forward with questions. So first, let me start with Nicole. The question is, what were the most helpful sources of information you used to make the decision to do gene therapy? Were there things that were not expected that you wish you knew in advance or that surprised you in the process? Um, honestly, because Matt was part of a phase one trial, we didn't have a lot of information to go off on. So um, I think it was the fact that it was a one-time treatment that really persuaded us um, into picking the gene therapy over the other treatment that was available. Um, and just like the animal studies, I like I said, I really I, I read all the research. I um I saw I saw plenty of like videos on the animal studies, but I didn't have a lot to go off on. Now there are available sources, being that the drug is actually available. So they have the web, their own website. All the information is there. And there's a lot of families that you know are on gene therapy now that you can talk to. I think right now the families are a great source. Um, so just talking to, I think, any of the parents is the best way to f get information on gene therapy. Actually, that's, that's really helpful, and that's, you know, often the case that, that, that informed and experienced parents who are passionate are really great source of information. Um, and Charles, can I ask you the same question? Were there um, sources of information that were most helpful to you in your decision, and were there things that you didn't expect that you wish you knew in advance? So there were no um, surprises during the process that I wish I had known in advance. Maybe the bone marrow aspiration. <laughs> um, I was put in contact with three people who had gone through the process before me in phase one, and I had talked to both of them, uh, two people who were doing very well um, after the, you know, the, the whole trial. I believe talking with my mother, my wife, of all the possibilities, um, I just decided to go ahead and sign up. Um, that was most of my resources and pretty much information that I used for my decision in gene therapy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Charles, there was another question for you from an audience member um, who asked, what additional information did you get the second time you considered a gene therapy trial that, that made a difference in your decision to participate? So I had did a little research, and I, um, from the first phase, I, there were, I guess, what kind of um, newer results that were out talking to doctors and gaining the knowledge on the steps or the processes, even the vector that was used uh, in the first phase. So that, that helped me decide as far as going ahead. Uh, that was new information that kind of certified everything. So I said yes to the second time. Great. Um, and another question, were you overall satisfied with your clinical trials experience and, and the care that you received and the care that your child received? So maybe we'll start with Nicole and then go to Charles for that one. Um, yeah, I consider um, ourselves very lucky that we were able to work with the team that we worked with. And Dr. Mendel and Dr. Alzadi are amazing doctors and amazing human beings. Um, they they really cared about the kids. They really they still are involved with the children, and they still like we still call them if we need anything. If we notice anything, if we have any questions, we can we know that we can still contact them. So we felt like we had a great support team at Nationwide. Even the clinical coordinators are wonderful. So we always had someone to go to. We always had, if we had any questions, if anything didn't seem right, um, we knew that we can contact the team there right away, and they would respond immediately. They really, truly love their job. They really are in it to 
basically cure these muscle disorders. And um, it was an amazing, it's still an amazing experience. And we still look forward to going to Columbus, Ohio and seeing them all once a year. Oh, that's great to hear that you had such an amazing team. And, and I think we told you Dr. Mandel appeared on our uh, webinar last month, and we're very grateful to him for recommending you for this webinar. <laughs> um, so, Charles, same thing for you. Overall, were you satisfied with your clinical trial experience and, and the care that you received during the trial? I was I still am, I still am extremely uh, satisfied with the care I received from NIH and Bethesda. I mean, working with Dr. Shea, Dr. Tisdale, the whole sickle cell team in general, inpatient, outpatient, I don't think I could have, you know, had a better team in my eyes. I mean, for my trial, they're, they're great. I've been, I've been sick before and been admitted into a lot of hospitals. A lot of times doctors come in take a look at me, maybe say two or three sentences and walk out and probably never, ever see him again. But at NIH, it was different. See, they, they walked me through the process. They held my hand when I broke down. Even at my hardest times, they stayed strong and professional. So I'm so grateful to have them on my side. And I can still reach out to them if I needed anything. Uh, it's, yeah, I don't think I could have had a better team. Oh, thank you. Got, you all are making us teary here at Nord. <laughs> um, so another question, Charles, for you. Um, Nicole, you mentioned that you're going back annually. Um, Charles, how long were you at NIH, um, and do you still go back for checkups, and, 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 and if so, with what frequency? Okay. Um, so I first want to say that I uh, said uh, my, rebirth, my rebirth date was – 2018 is 2017. So I've been going to NIH um, possibly about three and a half, four years, I believe, in total. Uh, the dates kind of vary because when I had my chemo, a, a lot of days I wasn't awake and I forgot a lot of things. So I'm um, putting the time together. But the overall protocol or trial, 17 years. So I still have, uh, what, 13 years left? On my trial, um, I go to NIH. At first, it was uh, every every month, and I believe it's every three months. And now I'm thinking I'm at the stage where it's every six months or six months to a year. Um, I think that, and then and then it becomes once a year, if I'm not mistaken. I need to go back and look. Yeah, and Charles, um, there was another question asking, so if you're traveling back and forth um, to NIH, um, do you have to pay for that, or is that paid for by the trial? How, how does the travel expenses work? NIH reimburses me for all travel expenses. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. And, Nicole, um, also, so how long were you, Nicole, at Nationwide, and, and you mentioned you go back annually, and is that the same thing that your travel expenses are reimbursed? Yeah, so for the first the first time we drove up, because he was so small we didn't want to get on a plane with him, um, for the first year it was not covered. Um, so we actually had to pay for any travel, and we were traveling back once a month after we left. Initially after that first month that we were there, we were traveling once a month. After the first year it was the company did start covering it, and they basically, yeah, they pay for our flight, but we stay at, we always stay at the Ronald McDonald House because it's convenient. It's right across the street from the hospital, and we love being there. But, yeah, as of right now, everything is covered. The travel is covered. Okay, great. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit. We hear from members of the rare community at times that they are, identity begins to be tied to their particular disease state and to the patient groups around that disease state. And so I'm wondering, post-gene therapy, has your connection with the SMA or sickle cell community changed, and, and if so, why, and, and in what ways? Um, of course. It's, it's a it's a tough question, and it's it's a tough answer. Um, so, at the beginning, 
And it's still it's still difficult because these children are being treated now so young, and children who were not supposed to make it past one, never supposed to walk, you know, are now running. So I, I think we're now seeing, but since most more kids are being treated, we're now dealing with um, a different type of. Um, so, but what I I did want to say was when he first got treated, it was hard for me to really involve myself in the community. First of all, because we weren't supposed to disclose any information, so people were wondering how this type one SMA baby was rolling around. And you do feel bad not being able to tell them, like, oh, he's part of a gene therapy trial. or, And not only that, like, you also feel, like, guilty because cause your child, you know, was able to participate in a trial and someone else's child either was too old or didn't make it. So it's it's difficult. It's difficult to be part of a community at, at that point, and you, you do feel a lot of guilt. But I do think that now as he's gotten older and since the drug has been released, I do think that it's been easier for us now to go to more events. And I actually love talking to, to the new parents or parents that are um, expecting a child. I've been in contact with several people just to talk about Mateo's experience with the gene therapy and what they can expect. So the community is changing because so many things are happening and these children are getting treated so early. I do think there is so much progress and it's just a different type. It's a different type of SMA at this point. Great, thank you. Um, and Charles, how about you after gene therapy? Um, has your connection with the sickle cell community changed and, and, and why and in what ways? Um, I believe the my connection with the um, with the sickle cell community has strengthened because at first I wasn't so active in the community, but now that you know I've gone through my whole trial, um, I'm starting to become more active in the community. That makes sense. I, I think when I put my word out there that I've gone through this trial, people are coming to me with questions, um, you know, and they just like to know how I'm feeling after life. So. In that aspect, I'm becoming more, um, you know, interactive or with with the with the community with sickle cell. Yeah, it's become I'm become more active. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, and you're being active today on the webinar with us. So thank you so much, Charles. Charles, I'll start with you on this one because um, you really detailed some some really difficult moments in in your journey, but. I'm wondering what was the most challenging part of your gene therapy experience and then the most rewarding part of your gene therapy experience. I can say the hardest part of the gene therapy was um, the chemo. Um, Out of everything, when that chemo hit me and uh, I looked in the mirror and I didn't know who I was, that, uh, that tore me apart on the inside. Um, it, it was really hard dealing with the fact that I didn't look the same. I didn't feel the same. And uh, it it hurt a lot. Um, but now, I mean, I feel great. I haven't had one complication since then. Um, I haven't had any hospital admissions, no blood drawn, no transfusions. I've been overseas and flown without any complications. So... Yeah. No, that's incredible. No, it looked like, I mean, it's, even when just showing, you know, the skin darkening and when we, we were saying when you were itching for, you know, months on end, even a week of poison ivy is terrible, and then chemo, heart attack, stroke. But anyway, very happy to hear that you're feeling great and went from, you know, being highly symptomatic and uncomfortable and hospitalized mm-hmm. all the time to, to doing great today. Um, so, Nicole, could you address the same question? What was your um, the most challenging part and, and the most rewarding part of your gene therapy experience? Um, with Mateo, luckily, we really didn't have any um, symptoms, and he didn't have any issues with the gene therapy. I think it was just time, waiting, waiting to see if it was going to work, waiting to see if you know, if he was going to sit up, if he was going to, 
crawled, he would be able to roll over. Um, that was that was the worst for us. Um, the truth is that Mateo, I don't think, fully understands that he has a genetic condition and that he was treated for it. We've tried to explain it to him, but he doesn't really get it. He sees himself as a normal kid. He acts like a normal child. Um, and even though we do keep him involved with the community and he has many friends with SMA who who do show symptoms, he kind of doesn't see it. He thinks they're all the same, which is amazing, um, but he really just, he doesn't get it. He doesn't grasp the the effects of SMA and the fact that he does have SMA. As a parent, I think that it's the time and it's also what still affects me is the not knowing. It's a trial. He was part of the phase one. Like the oldest kid is five years old now. So we still don't know what's going to happen in the long run. And I think just not knowing what's going to happen, him being, you know, baby number 10, one of the first, it's tough, but I honestly think it's all going to be good from here on. It's all been great. It's been one, a wonderful four years, and he continues to progress, and he continues to get stronger. So that would be the only thing that I think was a little hard on us, but everything else, and obviously just seeing him the way that he is today and seeing him, you know, walk into his preschool and do so well, that's definitely the reward for us. Yeah, no, and he's a he's a beautiful little boy. So another question for both of you, and maybe I'll start with you this time, Nicole, is what advice would you give to those who are considering gene therapy? Do it. <laughs> Do it. I know it seems scary. I know that um, I hear a lot of people talk about, you know, what are the symptoms? What can happen? What what about the liver? What about the – honestly, the pros outweigh the cons. I don't regret it. And that, I think that's the question that I get asked the most. Do you regret it? If you could have, you know, if you can go back, would you still choose gene therapy? And that's a yes. That's a yes. Gene therapy saved my son's life. And I would do it again. And if I had another child who needed to be treated, it would be with gene therapy. It's a one-time treatment, and that's basically it. You don't have to put your child through anything else. Matt doesn't. When he's sick, we're fine at home. We deal with it at home. He's had the flu, and he's been perfectly fine. We don't do any physical therapy. We don't need anything. So... I, I honestly think look into it. Don't be scared. I know it sounds like it's scary. Everyone is always afraid of the virus, but it's definitely worth it. Great. Thank you very much, Nicole. And Charles, same question for you. I would say go for it. <laughs> um, technology has changed. Um, and, I mean, before I had my gene therapy, I suffered a lot from sickle cell. The pain is horrible. Rated from 1 to 10, 25, easy. Um, and now, after the gene therapy, I mean, quality of life is great. So at first I was kind of skeptical because of, like, what Nicole said, the virus um, that you hear about. But I was, I was hurt. I was suffering. So I felt like, you know, I had nothing to lose. And thank God that it was, you know, it was, it was um, offered to me because now I'm looking forward and I feel great. And there's no more looking back. I would definitely advise anybody, just give it a chance. Look into the research, talk to doctors, your support system. Just, just give it a chance. They're, they're, working, they're working wonders. Thank you. Thank you both very much. A lot of comments are pouring in, and um, I just want to share with you, um, like one audience member says, this isn't a question, just profound admiration. You are all pioneers. Somebody else saying, thank you so much for these incredible speakers. Thank you. And lots of positive comments headed your way and, and well wishes from our, from our audience. 
Nicole, there was a question for here wondering if you've been able to connect with any other of the families who were participating in the same clinical trial that Mateo was in. Um, yeah, we actually um, just saw each other in, God, I want to say it was September, October of this year, and um, we all met up. We keep in contact. We still talk. Obviously, some of us are closer than others, but it's only 15 kids, so it's it's a small group, and we all keep in contact. So all the kids are amazing. Wonderful. So, Charles, there's also a question here for you wondering what your age is and if you're able to work and if your sickle cell disease is impacting your ability to work today. Um, so I am 39 years old, and uh, my sickle cell is no longer impacting my ability to work, ability to work. Um, when I did have sickle cell, I would become sick several times a week, and a lot of times I would I have to call off. But now I see a, a, a great a, a great change in that. I mean, it's just the flip side of a coin. Every day is a good day for me. I feel healthy every morning I wake up. So we are getting down to the end of the webinar, and um... – in closing, there, there, there's a question that I asked. That I, I feel like you've answered it to some degree, but I, I asked it to um, Dr. Mendel and Dr. Byrne um, in our last webinar, and I'd like to ask you something similar, which is there are risks and benefits associated with gene therapy, and so in your case, have all the benefits outweighed the risks? Um, yes. In my case, I honestly think um, 100% the benefits outweighed the risk. Um, obviously, with Mateo being the youngest child um, getting it at that time, I was terrified. Um, I think so were the doctors. Dr. Mendel might have been a little scared too, um, but it was exciting. And um, because he got it so young, that's the reason he's doing so well. He um, Once you lose these motor functions, it's harder to get him back, but he was so small that he was, it was able, um, the gene therapy basically stopped the progression. Um, so, yeah, it definitely, I, the thing is we didn't have any risk at this point. Like, we didn't, nothing really happened. His liver was fine, and till this day, we haven't had any issues with it. So, definitely outweighs um, the risk. I'm glad to hear that it has, Nicole. And you, Charles, um, as far as risks and benefits and have the benefits outweighed the risks? Um, the benefits have definitely out, outweighed the risk. I mean, in, in my case, when I was doing my research, the risk were uh, grow, uh, what's that, uh, host versus graft, where you're white blood cells attack other cells in the body, even to come into the whole, you know, gene therapy trial. But I, I mean, my, I'm feeling great. I produce now 50%, 47%, I think like 47% normal, you know, red blood cells. I feel great. So even with the risks that are involved, yes, I can confidently say that the benefits outweigh the risk. Oh, yeah. Oh, fabulous. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you both, um, Nicole and Charles, for your, your really incredible and, and inspiring presentations today. Um, thank you again to our sponsors at Amicus Therapeutics, Sarepta Therapeutics, Avrobio, and Bluebird. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.